meeting is being recorded. So we're good. Okay, can can one person at home speak up? Just just to confirm that we can hear you. Hi, we, John. Yeah, everything's okay. Good okay. luck. Okay, great. And I. <laughs> okay, so um, my talk tonight's going to be on um, my night photography, mostly at the Fire Island Lighthouse because it's a good location, offers a lot of opportunities. So I'll be talking a little bit about the lighthouse tonight, then showing photos, talking about how I've taken those photos. And let me not stand right there. <laughs> um, I'll also be getting to the around three, four weeks ago, there was a news article about a very heavily processed photo over the moon that went viral. And it sparked some discussion in the club about what, what, is, what color is real versus fake. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that because everyone who takes a photo of the moon has a different opinion on what color the moon should be. And I'll also be talking about image processing software that ties in with those colors. If at any point someone has a question, just um, speak up. No one here in the meeting is watching the text chat. Um, I'll check that at the end of the presentation. So a little bit about the Fire Island Lighthouse. Um, most of us have probably seen the Fire Island Lighthouse in person, but we have some remote members who perhaps haven't. Um, it's on the south shore of Long Island, on Fire Island. Um, it's one barrier beach east of Jones Beach um, and two from Long Beach, three from, I think, well, four from Coney Island. So it's along the south shore of Long Island. The lighthouse itself is 168 feet tall. It's the tallest lighthouse on Long Island. Although I, um, I haven't had a chance to confirm this. I think the Montauk Lighthouse might actually be higher above sea level because it's built on a cliff. Fire Island, the base of the Fire Island Lighthouse is almost at sea level. Um, it was built in 1858. It's the second lighthouse. There's, there's, there was a prior smaller lighthouse. The base of it is still partly visible. Um, it's not far from where it is. And since 2006, the Coast Guard no longer runs that lighthouse. It's not an official Coast Guard navigation beacon, but it's still an unofficial beacon run by a nonprofit for, for boaters. Now, one interesting thing is the Fire Island Lighthouse was originally built on the edge of Fire Island. Everything to the west oh, wow. is <laughs> new sand. All of Robert Moses State Park is relatively new land because the ocean currents keep picking up sand and moving it. So Fire Island is now six miles further to the west than it was at the time of the fire, that it, the inset graphic on the upper right shows how Fire Island moved. Since Long Island's become more populated and the Army Corps of Engineers has been pushed to take more aggressive action, well, Long Island changes a lot less than it used to, but still every so often we get a Sandy or some other storm comes in and rips a new channel where there wasn't one. Well, that's, that's normal. But it happened before we were here. It'll happen while we're here. It'll happen after we're here. So yeah, so all, all that land, this is all new. I don't know how Cactu State Park has changed. I'm assuming if this the ocean used to end here with waves sitting in here, this area was probably different also, um, but I wasn't able to find a good source for that.
Okay, so this, this is a view of the lighthouse across the bay from Captree Park. Um, this, this is my photo. I was actually very lucky on this day because I'm, I'm a couple of miles away from the lighthouse and with all that water in the way, usually a photo of the lighthouse from this distance, everything looks wavy and distorted just, just from atmospheric distortion. Um, but this, this was a good day. I had hoped to get the sun rising behind the lighthouse. Um, weather conditions didn't cooperate. Um, most of the sky was clear that day, but there was a band of clouds. I waited it out, unfortunately, around an hour after sunrise. I got a photo I'm very happy with, which was just one that I didn't intend, didn't plan to take at all. I had all of my planning about getting the sun just rising directly behind the lighthouse. So with weather, we take what we get. What lens did you use for that? This was a, a 500 millimeter lens. Yeah, this, this is a Cap Tree State Park. Um, it's a very popular place for sunrises and moonrises, depending on the time of year. Um, this day, I don't, I, I don't remember. The, the, the two good times of year, there's like a two week period in October. And then another one that shows up in February, because they're, they're equally spaced from December 21st. Um, so the sun is in roughly the same position both times. October out there on the sh on the bay is much nicer than February. <laughs> I know I know I was out there one February and the parking lot was a was an ice skating. It was just coated with ice. And you have to go up there. Um. Oh, to to go up the lighthouse. Yeah, I've the they're open from like I don't know, like ten to five. Um. I don't think seven days a week. I'm not I'm not sure what. They um, do a search for Fire Island Lighthouse. It'll take you to the organization that runs it. I think it, I think they charge ten dollars. I I've never gone up to the top. So this is a different view of the lighthouse from closer. Um, the people who are watching remotely probably don't have this issue. Um, but for those in the audience, um, this this projector is doing something like, like this. This moon looks sort of artificial. Um, it, it looks much nicer on my screen. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's only this 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 photo. There, there were other. I, this this was near Field Five. Um, again, the. The way I take my photos, I generally don't edit things out. So somebody was standing there. Eh, I, I'm not going to be so rude as to ask people who are standing near the beach, move so I can take my photo. And at the right edge, there's a bit of a pine tree sticking out. Yeah, I could Photoshop that out, but it's there. I couldn't get my photo in a way where I didn't have those things in it. So I'd love to make Oh, but John, you could maybe move the mouse out of the picture, the cursor. Yeah. No, it, it does not look that way. I'm, so, I'm sorry, George? If you can move the cursor, the mouse out of the picture. Oh, OK. It's nicer. <laughs> Thank you. It, Dave, it, it, it doesn't look inverted on my screen. But John? Yeah, sometimes it can improve it if you have a foreground bush or a tree or something. Oh yes, yes. Yeah, I, I, I feel that the branch on the right is a distraction. The person's head, though, in the photo, I feel adds to the photo. I thought it was somebody in the room between the bushes. Wait.
So this, this, again, this was, I had planned to be out there for um, the recent lunar eclipse, but when I got out there, it was foggy and cloudy. Um, so the moon is behind the lighthouse. That's what's causing the clouds to glow. But and I worked with what I had. And this photo I converted to black and white because the color to my eye, it sort of looked like this yellowish color from some sodium lights in the area. It was an unappealing color to me. So I turned it into a black and white photo because the photo wasn't about color. And I find that with, with, a, with the lighthouse beam, a very, very short photo, that beam just looks pencil thin and doesn't look nice. And with a very, very long, anything more than like five seconds, the beam is just a smear in the sky and you don't notice that it doesn't look like a lighthouse anymore because it's the light shining out between 60 degrees. So di different lighthouses have different light patterns. Um, if anybody does photograph fire on a lighthouse, a good starting point is a two second shutter speed. Yes, I, I, I believe so. I, it, it may have been a second and a half. It could have been three seconds, but it had to be in the two second range. Because the, I could check when when we're done. Um, it's probably it, it might be eight hundred and two second long shutter speed, and probably um, my f stop was probably around a five six for this because everything was relatively far away. Isn't there right information with uh, in the file alone? Yes, yes, but yes, but but. but but I don't want to start clicking oh, okay. through through things in the middle of the presentation. No, no, this right this this was right at Fire Island. Okay. This here I was a little bit north. Um, there's a boardwalk to the north that leads to the bay, and I was on that boardwalk. The, uh, this was the same night as that prior photo. The, cl the clouds went away, um, and I was able to get this photo um, of the lighthouse and the moon. Uh, this this was sort sort of what I had in mind for for the evening. It's it's not. No, I thought it was. Yes, no. There were three yeah. stars. Yeah. No. It's, it wasn't Orion. I I think it was constellation that was. When I, this? The the one that was a couple of months ago. May, right? Yes. Yeah. May was May fifteenth. In October. This was also a five hundred millimeter. It was like a it was a one fifty to five hundred zoom. If if I wasn't at five. I probably wasn't at 500 for this because the moon would have been closer. Again, I can check. I, I may have been. At, I'm going to guess 250 millimeters for this photo. Oh, man. So this, oh, man. this was um, a couple of years ago. Um, there was a very nice um, alignment of the crescent moon, Venus, and Mercury. Mer Mercury was very was very far away from the sun, so it was it was easy to spot Mercury, and they were they were in a line at sunset. So this this sort of here I was further east and looking towards the west. But this I I knew that for a couple of nights the moon, Venus, and Mercury would be would be in this in this line. It's a nice alignment. It adds some interest to yeah. the photo. Yeah, this is a very, I remember this, yeah, two years ago. This is a very wide time period. Yes. Look yep. how far south the moon was. Right, and yes. How far yep. north was. And uh, the funny thing is that most of the time, uh, when you take that, we're working well with uh, other planetary conjunctions, 
Merkley's always first down to the rise, but this time, Merkley's above Jupiter, uh, um, Venus, and, and the Moon. Now, that's a rare shot. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. I, that is a rare shot. Yeah, this, I, I don't recall Mercury ever being this far. Like, it, Mer Mercury was setting like two, three hours after the sun. It was, yeah. it was, it was a very um, interesting alignment of, of Mercury. And they're pretty spread out away from the sun, too. Yeah. yeah. So this, this photo is the same night. Um, looking in a different direction where at a wider angle and, and you can see just how high mercury was that's the that's the, the fire island inlet bridge yeah so it was the thin crescent moon and as usual for new york the low horizon is at, at sunset um, is often this not quite an orange color. It's more like a schmutzy brown from 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 air pollution and haze. This is um, using the same lens at a different zoom setting of that scene, and it's interesting that. Uh, um, with the crescent moon, you can barely see some detail on the unlit side of the moon. This was here. I was these two photos. I was north of the lighthouse on the, the bay beach looking westwards. No, no, no. I'm here. I'm I'm near the I'm near the lighthouse, or I I'll I'll show on a map where I was for these photos. Okay, so this this is not the moon. It's um, the partial solar eclipse. Yes, it is the moon. A little bit. Early Oh yes, team, <laughs> correct. Yes, you are correct. It is the moon. Well, <laughs> but but we're not seeing the moon. <laughs> so this this was a at sunrise. And late in that same eclipse, yes. So to 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 take these photos, I, I plan out ahead of time, and I'll, I'll show how I do that, where, exactly where the sun's going to be at a given time. And I, I sort of plan where to stand. I just have to do a little bit of, a little bit of calculation to figure out how far away I should set up so the angle, so, so the sun is at, or moon is at the correct height. The lighthouse and also of course my my calculations are never perfect so a bit of running is often involved also <laughs> john can i interrupt for a second oh, sure, I, I i tried to copy you and i went to orient to get a picture of the lighthouse and they weren't going to let me go down the beach there's two people came and stopped me <laughs> so i didn't plan well enough but they did let me go in the end okay <laughs> uh, matt you gotta you gotta plan that too will they let you in yes oh yes um i a lot of these photos that I've done at Fire Island, I'm there quasi legally. Yeah. <laughs> I have a permit, but the permit's for a different field. But <laughs> I've never had problems so far. Yeah. So, okay, um, for for people who are remote, um, somebody just asked what filter I used. I was 
risky with this photo. I did not have There's a no I did not have a filter. I used a very, very short shutter speed. I made sure not to look through um, the optical viewfinder. And when when I used the LCD to line things up, I made sure to only use it for very, very short periods of time and then put the lens cover back on because um, the sun can heat things up enough to yeah. damage yeah. the inside of the camera. And also, don't look directly at the sun. The, the, the clouds and haze help. The, the reason why I didn't use a filter, if I used the filter, I would have gotten the sun, but the lighthouse and the background behind the lighthouse, both would have been black. Yeah. And those, there are two seagulls towards the upper left. Those also would have been on a black background and not visible. So yeah, I, I will take solar not <laughs> without the filter. It risks damage to the camera. Um, and I also, I make sure to only do it when the sun is low in the sky. So it's more attenuated by the atmosphere. Thank you. So this um, was a different conjunction. This is Venus and Jupiter near each other and the lighthouse on the left. So, so this was a shot taken from the beach at sunrise looking off. You're killing us. <laughs> <laughs> these are stunning. So for taking these photos, they're there's a lot of planning that I do. And then around half the time because of either weather or other circumstances, my planning doesn't work as intended and I come home disappointed or sometimes I'm fortunate and a different opportunity shows up. So among the things that I have taken into consideration, terrain, there's the Fire Island Lighthouse, so you can, there's some ground, well, there's a lot of ground to the east and west of it, but to the north and south, there's only a little bit of land before you're standing in either the bay or the ocean. So if a certain angle I want, and sometimes it just doesn't work, and that time of the year, perhaps another time of the year, the sun rises from a different position, where I can stand someplace else. The moon phase. Um, I like to take photos of either a near full moon, so it looks nice and symmetrically round, or a crescent moon. The, the, during the middle of the lunar cycle, I just, I, I don't think the moon's as photogenic. It's like, if, if the moon's half lit, just doesn't work as, I find it doesn't work as well in my photos. I've seen some great photos, of, especially close-ups of a okay, half-lit moon. You see all the craters right along where the terminator between the light and dark sides are. I, I just have it, I just don't see it that way. Um, I pay attention to astronomical events. When will there be a lunar eclipse? When will there be a solar eclipse? Um, and weather, of course. But getting into some details on that, um, the sunrise, different times of the year, sun rises in different positions. Like we know the sun rises in the east, sets in the west. But during the middle of the summer, it's setting pretty far to the south. Sorry, it, it's rising. Well, it, during the summer, it's rising to the to the north, yeah. actually, and doing a bigger circle through the sky because, as our seasons change. In the winter, it's much further to the south. So, as an example, to to see the sun rising behind the lighthouse during the winter at Cactree Park it works pretty well because the sun's rising 
to the south, so the lighthouse is in between the sun. Meanwhile, during the summer months, you, you would need to stand on the beach south of the lighthouse to see the sun rising behind the lighthouse. The way the moon operates is also different and it's even more complex because on consecutive days, the sun rises in almost the same exact position. The sun only shifts a little bit every day. The moon is also on a 28 day cycle. And if, if you look at the moon rise today, and one week later, it's going to rise from very different, different points. Because every day, the moon rises from a slightly different place. So at Fire Island, um, the lighthouse there, like, these, these arrows aren't denoting any exact location. They're general location. So, so the lighthouse, um, is accessible from almost 360 degrees. I mean, you can get to it from the north a little bit, east and west. So all of this for the lighthouse, all of this area here is accessible. Um, and you can also, also capture it. There's nothing, the only land that's up here is so far away from the lighthouse as it's not useful for photography. The, the bridge, the bridge you can get, you, you, you can get to it, capture it. There's a fishing pier and um, shoreline as far as photos from the bridge. Um, the photos that I showed of the bridge, the, the two photos with the, the moon, Venus, and Mercury, I was somewhere over in, I believe, this area here where I'm highlighting. I think I parked in field four and walked across here. There's no, they, if you do go here, expect mosquitoes, expect ticks. Just it's the reality of traipsing through the brush on the island. Um, because there are there are no real accessible beaches over here. You also there's also a little bit of a limit. You can't come all the way over here because there's the Coast Guard station here, and that's fenced off to the public. As far as um, the lighthouse goes, there's a boardwalk um, that goes from field five to the lighthouse. The boardwalk continues, on, very few people walk that boardwalk, but it does continue to, to, to the bay. And then from there, you could walk all the way back here. But this, this is a long walk. So if you're looking for some, for a photo of the bridge, and you want to be to the east of the bridge, my suggestion is park at field four or five and cross the parkway. The, the way I do it, I'll, I'll do a drive through, do the turnaround here, come back here, look for a spot to traipse through the bushes, and then I park in the parking field. I, I considered parking right up, right along the parkway, but um, I wouldn't want to leave my car there for a long time because you're likely to get ticketed. Um, so I park in the field and do do the longer longer walk. Does anybody have any particular questions about these locations and about about the geography of Fire Island. Okay, I'll go to the next slide. So then to help with planning, um, there's a variety of apps and websites that I use. Um, I'll talk about the photographers and ephemeris and weather.gov more on slides. And I'll briefly mention some other apps. There's something called Sun Surveyor. What that does is it uses your cell phone um, <clears throat> camera and you can hold it you'll so you'll see a picture as as you move your cell phone around you'll see um 
what you're looking at, but it will overlay with a heads up display where the sun and moon will be at any given time. There are other apps that can do that also. There's something called Photo Pills that has that capability. Um, then there's Solarium, which is planetarium software. That's good for seeing a, if you want to check, oh, the moon's going to be up tomorrow night. Where will Jupiter and Saturn and Venus be also? Or what constellations will be around that? So Solarium gives you a lot of detail about the night sky. That's a great app. It's also available as a Windows program. Um, Astrospheric is a weather forecasting app and website. I prefer weather.gov, um, but Astrospheric is good also. And then Google Maps is very helpful again, for, for planning something out. Um, if you're looking, okay, where, where can I park? Where can I walk? Google Maps has aerial photography. It has street view. So it's, it, it's very helpful for planning out photo sessions. So this, this is the weather.gov website. And this, this shows why I like weather.gov in that they're, they're 48 hour forecasts. Um, it's, it's what they call their hourly forecast if you click on it. But you can drill down and get graphs for what they're predicting And the there these like this is the transition. This is sunset. This is sunrise. So so at a glance I could see okay it's sunset on this day. Sunset is going to be around fifty percent cloud cover. And as the night goes on, cloud cover is going to decline, and sunrise is going to be pretty clear. So if I if I wanted to take photos of both sunset and sunrise. I wanted to know which one was going to be, be a better opportunity. Now, of course, if, if I'm trying to get things lined up at certain times of the year, I might only be able to do it at sunset or only at sunrise. But this forecast, with this forecast, I would know, oh, the morning is going to be much better than the evening. Is point is being accurate? Um, I find it relatively accurate. Yes, it's relatively accurate. Um, the, the exact numbers I can't vouch for, but the overall thing, it's very helpful. It'll also show sometimes, you'll see like this, sometimes there will, in this forecast, it didn't happen, but some forecasts, there might be a spike where it's going to be mostly clear, and then a bank of clouds is supposed to roll in, and then it's supposed to go out. This will, most weather forecasts will just say, Clear. They're, they're not going to say clear except for an hour of clouds. You can look at this and see, oh, there's going to be a bank of clouds rolling in at right around sunset. The forecast might be off by an hour, right? Either way. So it's like, but you can at least make an educated decision. Do you want to risk going out or not? It's also helpful to say, oh, it's cloudy now, but they're showing. It's supposed to clear up very soon. So, so the forecast for the next six hours is very accurate. And as you go further out into that 48 hour period, it's, there's more chance of things changing. Steve? Are they preset locations or can you put in any order? You can put in pretty much any, they, there's a search here and you can put in pretty much any town. And it'll, it's, this isn't, you. It's not going to give you a micro forecast like between field two, the field two parking lot and the field five for parking lot. That it won't show. Well, but New York, so it's well, this 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 is the New York office, but the the actual point I was checking is here. It says point forecast salt air New York, which is a town on Fire Island. But it's a, it's a pretty good search. Like you, you can enter Fire Island Lighthouse or Fire Island Inlet, and they'll all, so, so you don't have to describe things one certain way. You can put a zip code in, you can put a town name in. 
so, would be nice if you use this and the astro spirit. spirit. I yes. tend to just yep. use astro yep. spirit. And once in a while they're wrong. Yep. Yep. And th there's also a, a more general text based forecast that shows like what the whole day is supposed to look like. So th this is something that I'll check a cup. Like if I say, oh, the weather's supposed to be clear. I'm going to go out and take photos or the, well, this is going to be partly cloudy. Those clouds might make a nice photo. I'll, I'll use this to further refine things. And sometimes this will tell me that uh, it's not worth going out for photos, or it might say, oh, I need to do something different. Like one of the things that this will include is fog. It's an optional thing that you would click on here. Um, it's also helpful in that, yeah, so um, when I was com completely different than Fire Island, when I was out in Arizona in October on vacation, um, it was helpful to know when lightning storms were going to come through. So it, it's, it's a very detailed forecast um, also tell about wind. If, if, if you have wind gusts, wind gusts and taking a wide angle photo is okay. Putting a 500 millimeter lens trying to take a high magnification photo of something when it's windy is just to me an exercise in frustration because every, Im or most, most of the photos are going to end up blurry just from the wind shaking the, the camera. But it's, yeah, it's weather.gov. It's the, it's the National Weather Service website. And this, this is the photographer's ephemeris. Um, there's a website as well as the phone app. So this shows in detail. I plug in a date. There's a 24 hour clock here I can drag. So it's, this is at 11.46 PM. This, this was planning for the lunar eclipse photo. So it's saying if I stood, if I stood here at 11.46, the moon would be in this line, the moon down, the moon down here. And there's like, so this, this is how I sort of figured out where I needed to stand. And I knew that, okay, if, if I'm a little early, if I'm a little late, I would shift along this beach accordingly. Because the, the walkway here would only work for a very short, very short interval than the moon, as the moon moves. If I was standing here, if I wanted to be closer to the lighthouse, I couldn't really move east or west here. Very, very heavy brush here. And also illegal to go. I, I'll go to, I'll go to areas that where I'm quasi legal, but areas that are completely closed off to the public for like wildlife preservation. That I won't. That I won't go into. If it's roped off, I won't go into it. So the photographer's ephemeris is a very helpful piece of software. John, if, if I use the photographer's ephemeris on an iPad, there's sunrise, sunset, moonrise, moonset, and I see the lines, but I don't see the choice at the bottom. Of, okay, this is because you're in vertical mode. No, well, this on my phone, I swipe if I if I press here and swipe left and right. There are like five different little displays down oh, here. Oh, cool. Okay. So, so you, so this display stays. This upper display stays the same. I keep clicking. <laughs> the, the panel at the bottom changes. Oh, okay. It'll show sunrise and sunset and moonrise and moonset times as one of the panels. One is this panel that shows angles and lets you pick the time. There are other there are other mini panels down there also. Right. 
Okay, so now, now we'll talk a little bit about camera settings. And two photographers can go out the same exact location, take very similar photos with completely different camera settings. So what works for me, what works for me could work for somebody else, but somebody else might also have completely different settings that give an image that looks very, very similar. So there's no one true set of camera settings. If, if you have your shutter faster, you might also have to increase your ISO to compensate. But as long as you're within reasonable ranges, there are a lot of different ways to get a photo. Well, I'll talk a little bit about shutter speed, specifically because of the lighthouse. Um, the more you magnify the sun or the moon, um, in general, the faster you want your shutter to be to avoid blur, both from the camera perhaps shaking in the wind, as well as just them moving in the sky. At 500 millimeters, um, the moon moves a noticeable amount in even 30 seconds. Um, so I find it high magnification, even a two second long photo of the moon isn't quite as sharp as a one second long photo. And um, for, for the full moon, you can often take much faster photos, but with a, with a very fast shutter speed, the lighthouse beam doesn't have a chance to sweep at all. Because the, the lighthouse beam, it's, it's, it's moving around in a constant circle. So the longer the shutter is open for, the more of the sweep of that beam you'll see in the photo. And I find that around two seconds makes the lighthouse beam look nice. And um, cameras um, are, they're so smart, but very often they get confused by having an empty blank sky. Like if, if you take a photo of the moon and the lighthouse in an automatic, in an automatic mode, you'll probably get, the, the camera will probably look at the photo, look at the scene and say, oh, this is very, very, very dark. So I'll make something very, very bright. And you'll get a gray sky and completely white moon and completely blown out lighthouse that a lot of cameras will end up doing that. So, and some cam cameras have settings to, every camera works slightly different. It's just something to be aware of. I, but I strongly recommend, for, especially for the, at night, use manual mode. During the day, automatic modes work great. And that's, that's usually what I, what I use. The nice thing about automatic modes, if light's changing, the camera automatically adjusts for it. You don't have to keep saying, oh, well, is this part of the sky brighter than that sky? Oh, there's a white cloud here. I need to make changes. And then cameras can take photos in different, the files they take can be or saved in formats. Most cameras, you can save things in either JPEG format, which is very convenient to work with. I mean, it's a very flexible format. Anything can read JPEG. But then most cameras also have another format that's called RAW. It's every camera manufacturer has their own file format for RAW. Or, or they might use what's called DNG format, which is a little more flexible. Um, if you're familiar with TIFF files, those are also often like a raw file. It, it just means that they're, the raw files hold more data than the JPEGs. But a, a, a JPEG, you can take off your camera, you can email it to somebody and they can instantly view it. A raw file, you have to process first with either Photoshop or other other software. There's something called GIMP, which stands for New Image Manipulation Program. That's that's free, um, and a lot of cameras come with software. Um, the reason why I generally don't use JPEG format is 
JPEG files, they use what's called lossy compression. To make the files smaller, there's, the, the file gets shrunken. Mathematically, the camera looks at, the, oh, there's a block of black sky here. So convert this entire area to black. It's, that's more efficient storage wise than saying, this pixel is black, this pixel is black, this pixel is black. But in that process, if there's one star, one dim star in the middle of that area, JPEG might ignore that star and get rid of it. Um, there have been tests with, where if you load a JPEG, make no changes to it, save it, reload it, save it again, do that a few dozen times, the quality noticeably decreases. So again, JPEG but for, for daytime photos often works very well. I prefer using raw format more flexible. And another reason why is because of white balance. Cameras have some difficulty when setting colors. They make some educated guesses about the scene. So this, this, this is an example from NASA's website, a photo on Mars. There's, this is the data they got from the camera. Then they process it two different ways. They apply what they call natural, a natural looking color based on what they know about Mars. And then they tried to process it as if it was a typical Earth scene. And this looks like Earth, not Mars, but the colors are sort of wrong. I, again, it's, it's subjective, but that, the photo on the right is sort of colored. If Mars had Earth's atmosphere, what would Mars look like? With, with a raw file, a raw file collects data and then you can apply different white balance settings to it. With a JPEG file, it's tougher to do that. Like, if, especially in indoor lighting. If you take a picture, um, for, for people who remember film, you take a picture in incandescent lights or under fluorescent lights, people's skin might look yellowish or too blue. Well, that's, that's a sort of, a, it's a white balance issue. So, JPEG, the white balance gets set at the time you take the photo. Um, with raw formats, there's more flexibility. If, if the camera estimates things poorly, or you just want to show the scene a different way than what your camera says in terms of colors, um, the raw format gives you more flexibility. With, yes, yep. Yeah, so like with, with, with sort, sort of like Photoshop, you can change white balance and, and, and you can test 10 different settings. What looks, what looks best to you? With JPEG, you get, a, you get much more flexibility. For daytime photos with relatively good sunlight, none of this matters. When you're taking photos at night, it becomes much trickier. Also, Photos of the Milky Way. Also, um, there's a, there are white balance challenges there. Uh, when you're processing it, I'm assuming you need to process section. Right? Yes. Um, what are you? What setting are you doing? Okay, I'll um, I'll I think I have an answer a few slides from now. Let me just check. Time. Okay, some, some other camera considerations. When, I, when I'm taking those photos of the lighthouse and the moon, both in them, if I'm at high magnification, um, do I wanna focus on the lighthouse, on the moon? Sometimes I'll focus on the lighthouse and then change the focus so I'm a little bit off, so I'm like halfway between the two of them. It's, there's no right answer. Um, it's important to be focused, I think, on one of them, 
a completely blurry photo wouldn't be good, but the photo could feature the lighthouse, it could feature the moon, and, um, or it could try to blend the two of them. Um, at, at wider angles, focus is less, a little less important. It's still important, but if there are errors, they're much less noticeable because you're not zoomed in as much. Oh, two questions. Back first. Yeah, uh, John, do you, um, in, in, uh, that's a, that's a good point. in focusing on a lighthouse and the moon, do you um, ever stack your photos? One put in front of the lighthouse, one on the other, or several on the lighthouse, several on the moon, and stack them? Okay, um, the, the, the question at home is whether I, I'll take multiple photos, like of the moon and the lighthouse, and then stack them. In general, I don't do that. Because I find that I'm, it take it takes me more trouble than it's worth in Photoshop. Yes, I I can composite the two photos, but because the the sky isn't perfectly black in between them, well, there's there's always a seam between the two that I'm not quite happy with. There's there's a photo I took of the skyline of New York City years ago. Where I took three photos and then combined them at night. I really like the result. I have it printed wide on a wall at home, but I probably spent 10 hours of processing on that one photo because the clouds from photo one to photo three shifted. So when I combined them, the, the buildings were easy to combine, but to get a sky that looked good, I had to do a lot of work. I, I know more about Photoshop now. Now it might only take me three hours, but it would still be painful. <laughs> have, you, have you tried uh, some later stacking? Um, I've, I've used it on night sky photos. I've never used it with any foreground elements. Because, because you did a yeah. good job of blending in your foreground with your sharp mm -hmm. foreground with your night. Mm -hmm. I just was going to Okay. I hear okay. Yeah. Um, Matt's question was about the software sequator. Oh, Dave had a question? Yeah, so just, uh, you said something about setting the processing yeah. and you're trying to get to it. When you're doing that, um, your, your, your output screen or your projection screen or whatever you're looking at, how are you convinced that that image is correct and ultimately what you want? Oh, how okay. that translates to digital monitoring? Oh, okay. So um, Dave Bush has asked a question about, like, sort of, when I'm doing processing my photo on my computer screen, how do I know that that's going to look the same on other devices? Well, um, one, the short answer is I don't. The more detailed answer is it's, it's not absolutely critical. What, what I do on my home monitor, I go through a process called calibration to adjust the colors. So the colors are reasonably close to a standard. So some monitors that might, some monitors might look more bluish than others, some might look more reddish. Mine, mine's sort of a, a medium, right? I picked, yeah, there's, there's a calibration process that it takes a, a small camera, you hold it up against your screen and it shows like, this is supposed to be a standard color and the, that camera measures the color. But also um, an aspect of that is how are people going to view the photo? Of some photos that look great on a big screen look awful on a phone because you just don't see details. I, someone, someone might have some great photo that looks fantastic printed as a 10 foot poster. You look at it on a phone and you might not see any details at all Similarly, some things that look good on a phone. Um, phones are pretty forgiving photo-wise. You might have something that's out of focus, but on the small screen, it looks good. Blow it up large. Also, is something going to be printed? Um, a dark, a, the sky background at night. What looks black on a monitor looks a certain way because the monitor is backlit. Backlit, if you print it out on paper, that's frontlit, 
it's it's different. The type of paper you use. Um, Stan Stan Honda, who's in this, yet yeah, he prints yeah, his photos, and to print one of his photos, he goes through a very very detailed process. He carefully chooses what paper to use, what type of ink. It's a it's a very involved process for fine art. Um, yeah, um, are you saying before when you want to image the lighthouse and what is inside, that you find that the lighthouse may be a little blurrier or the moon is a little blurrier and you have the lighthouse blurrier? Um, so, how you can narrow down the F stuff? Yes. Does that help to uh, clear it up a little bit? I mean, there's stuff down the F stuff? Yes. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, Frank's question was about um, like if if the moon and lighthouse are both in the photo, if you change the top down the after, change the F stop. Like for example, changing from F five point six to F eleven. Right, right. Yes. As as the aperture gets smaller, you get more what's called depth of field in the photo, and focus becomes more forgiving. But then you also have the challenge. You have to either slow down the shutter, or you have to. Yeah. So. So it's all it's all a trade off, and yeah, I that's something that I considered as I was taking the photo. I didn't want to take that photo with an like f twenty two um, because I I knew what what shutter speed. I was sort of constrained to shutter speed. I didn't want my ISO to go up to twenty thousand and have a very grainy photo. So yeah, so. So some noise and static in the photo was okay. Some blur in the photo was okay. So it's all, it's all a set of trade-offs. And what, again, what looks good to one person might look awful to somebody else. People have different preferences. Processing correct to, to a certain extent. Um, yeah, if, if something is so noisy if, that you have no good data, there's only so much that noise processing can do. Or at a certain point, then you start getting away from photography and the digital art. Like some, I personally hate this. Sometimes you'll see a photo of, oh, that's a lovely sunset. And you'll see the sun as it's setting. And there's some nice colorful clouds. And then you'll see someone, and you'll see a full moon a full moon in the same scene next to the setting sun, and the moon is in front of the clouds. Clearly, that's that's fake. The full moon is always 180 degrees away from the sun. But on <laughs> on Facebook, people are some people are much less <laughs> discerning than I am, and I I'm I'm, gonna, I'm not a snob, but I want a photo to at least be. A photo. If somebody wants to create digital art, create a painting, that's fine. But don't present something that's not real, as if oh, this is the night sky. Just like deep sky for the, the deep sky stuff that a lot of our members do, looks fantastic. It's and it, it scientifically re represents what the sky is like. But if someone were to say, oh yes, this is how it looks. Through a pair of binoculars, they'd be they'd be lying. They'd be misrepresenting what the photo shows. So, yeah, other considerations are what lenses do you own? Um, I've been doing photography for for a while, so I've accumulated lenses. I have flexible choices. If you're newer. Or you just don't do as much photography, and you don't want to spend as much money on the hobby. Well, whatever lens you have, you can plan photos that work well with the lenses you have. And then cell phones. Cell phones, they're cell phone cameras have made such great advances. Um, they're they're very good for wide angle scenes. Um, in the dark, though, the amount of processing that the cameras do internally st start, um, there are limitations on what cell phones can and can't 
do. But if if you're sharing your phone, your, your picture to be viewed on a phone, the fact that when you look at it, a, a big monitor, it's draining. Well, if, if the intent of the photo is, to, oh, here's a shot of the night sky from when I was on vacation, wherever. And you're sending it to someone who's going to look at it on a phone. Oh, you trying to say, oh, a photo that can't be printed huge is good. That that would just be, be a wrong opinion you can have. So you just, have, you just have to think about how is the photo intended to be used. And so cell phones, some of the photos that I took today probably could have been done, like, especially the, the wide angle, one of like the lighthouse on the left, and the two planets off on the right, that could have been done on a cell phone and it wouldn't have looked any different. John, what is your zoom? Is it the 200 to 500? It's a, it's, I, I have an older, it's a Sigma 150, 150 to 500 oh, okay. zoom. Right. Now Sigma has a 150 to 600. 600 yeah. Okay, so I'm going to briefly talk about color. Okay, what, what color should the moon be in a photo? Or what color is the moon? And to our eyes, we look at the moon and some people say, oh, it's gray. Other people might say it's white. And you might give different, if, if you're, if, if you step out of a, brightly lit house at night and look up at the moon, the moon looks gray. If you were in a dark area and suddenly glance at the full moon, the moon looks white because, because your eyes aren't, your eyes were dark adapted. So the moon can be different colors to different people at the same exact time, depending on conditions. So during a lunar eclipse, the moon is definitely reddish because the light coming around the edges of Earth's atmosphere, and that that can that reddish color can change from eclipse to eclipse depending on whether there are forest fires, if um, there's been a volcanic eruption, how high the moon is, or is it lower on the horizon? This, this was the photo that was shared a lot. This, this is not my photo, but some people took a photo and they, they purposely exaggerated the cup. They, they pushed the sliders to a hundred in Photoshop. And so the, this is, this color is present on the moon. It's just it's greatly exaggerated in this photo. Our eyes don't see this color um, because it's too faint. Um, but by exaggerating the color, if if a similar thing was done with a daytime photo on Earth, the grass would end up being fluorescent green. The sky would be this glowing blue. They'd be very unnatural colors. They'd be the actual. They they'd be the, based on the actual color data. But then the color gets amplified in software. So they, they also opened up the shadow. That would be black in real life. Correct. Yes. Well, I I think what they did with this photo is they took the photo during different moon phases, and they and then they combined it later. Now, um, I zoomed in. Like it's it's a very very high resolution, and I, in my opinion, as you get zoomed in very, very close, their processing wasn't aligned well enough. You, you sort of see like a double image in some spots. I get it's far better than anything that I've done. Uh, but if, if I look at it real critical, like the, the news articles were saying, this is the best photo of the moon ever taken. No, it's a very good photo, but If, if somebody really drills down into it, um, in terms of detail, 
um, I've seen some of our members get more detail on them. It's just, it's, it was an interesting choice for them to push the color as far as they did. But the moon does, it's, it's in, and something like this can even have a scientific value because it, those colors are because of different materials on the surface of the moon. The reddish colors indicate there's a trace of iron there that's rusted because Earth's atmosphere affects the moon. Yes, our, 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 we think of our atmosphere, it ends long before we get to the moon, but occasional oxygen atoms can escape out into space and over millions of years, Earth's atmosphere has contributed to rust on the moon. So this, this is my photo. So, so here's a moon that's, this moon sort of looks bluish because I wasn't taking a photo specifically of the moon. I was waiting for something to move in front of the moon. So, so during the day, if, if I made this moon look like the moon at night, it would be an unnatural looking photo. Similarly, this one, which was, which was taken during, during the day. Was that an osprey? In the yes, movie? yes, in this photo, this, this is an osprey. Yeah, this, this photo wasn't at Fire Island, it was at Jones Beach for the air show. So here's, in this photo, the moon is black. Total, total eclipse. So the, the moon is completely unlit. The only light is getting from the sun is around the very edge. Now, this one again is not my, this one is not my photo. This is um, a photographer who's taken a lot of moon photos over the course of several years combined many of them into a montage. And these were all colors that she saw at different times. Yes, yep. Well, the, the, like these different colors can be due to, well, when the moon's lower, if, if the moon is, if, if you're taking a photo of the full moon and it's just rising, it will look reddish. At midnight, it's going to look more, more neutral white. Um, if there are forest fires around, the smoke will change the color. That purple one, I'm not sure what caused that purple one. Um, I don't think it's fake. <clears throat> I've just never seen a purple moon. Maybe, maybe there was a chemical fire and yeah. Does, does anyone in the audience has, has anybody in the audience ever seen a purple moon? Yes, once. <laughs> very oh. heavy smoke. Very heavy smoke. Okay. Uh, the orange one—that's the time when the fire, the fire, yeah. Yeah, so all of these colors are valid for the moon. The question is like, for example, during a lunar eclipse or during, as the moon is rising, how red should the moon be? Well, it can be different amounts and some photographers might choose to exaggerate that color more than others. And everyone has their own tastes. The sky also, the, the sky, um, two people can take a photo of the moon on the same night and one, one, one person, their sky might be moderately gray. Another person might adjust their photo or different camera settings where the sky background is completely black. They're both valid photos, um, but it's just a question of choices. So now, now we're on 
our last topic of image processing, and I've already spoken a lot about this, is like how much to process. So in my opinion, do as little as needed until the photo looks like the way you want it, and then stop. So if the way your camera processes JPEG files is perfectly in line with the way you want to take photos, use JPEG mode and do no processing at all. Um, but I, I, I suggest at least experimenting with the raw modes and software to see maybe what your camera is doing. Maybe you could do something that's you might be able to further improve on the photos you're taking if you're not currently using software. And uh, should, should you process every photo extensively? Probably not. If, if you're at a family event and you just took 20 photos of your relatives, you probably don't, it, it's not a portrait session where you're going to sit there, oh yes, my my uncle has a mall. I'm going to erase <laughs> erase that mall. <laughs> I'm going to airbrush out everybody's wrinkles. No, that's that, in my opinion, is ridiculous. Although I've seen some people who, again, with selfies, every selfie that they post is a they put through a filter, and their selfies look nothing like they actually look in real life. <laughs> but. What's good varies from viewer to viewer, and the way the phone's the, the way the photo is going to be viewed is is important. Um, on a big screen, um, you need to look for more things like some sometimes cameras with removable lenses. Sometimes a piece of dust can get in and land on the sensor, and that that'll leave a little dark spot on the photo. On a cell phone, you'll never notice that. If you're looking at the photo on a 45 inch TV and standing three feet away from that TV, you might notice that, oh yeah, what's this dark spot in the blue sky? It's that there was a piece of dust on the sensor, which can be corrected with software or you can clean your camera sensor. <laughs> but um, so, Viewing on a phone is much more forget the, the larger the photo gets, the, the more detail you see in the photo. And some photos are about detail, the photos are about it, there's some photos if if you're taking a photo of a nice cloud formation, there's nice color in it, well, being perfectly focused might not even matter. Because it's about it, it might be about the color. So we've already mentioned most of this software, I guess. So image processing software, um, Photoshop is such a standard that people will even call processing Photoshopping things. Um, Photoshop is more advanced than most people need. It's because it, it, it tries to do everything. It's not just for photography. It can also be used for painting. There are some people who paint, not using paints, who paint on a computer. Well, Photoshop has also features for that. Um, it has things that only people who are doing advertising photos might need. Um, so, so Photoshop has a, it's a big learning curve. Lightroom is a simpler version of Photoshop. Then there's GIMP, which is similar to Photoshop, also a very complex piece of software where 90% of the features, the, the average user of the more advanced programs never touch 90% of the features, They're only using 10% of what's there, but every photographer is using a different 10% based on what their preferences are. And there are often different ways of getting the same result. The Sequator software, that's stacking software. That lets you do things like take multiple photos of the same scene and then combine them 
to, for, for example, brighten the photo. Um, perhaps you, perhaps the scene was so dark. Like a typical use case for sequator is you're someplace very, very dark. You're taking a photo of the Milky Way, and maybe there's a tractor on the ground that you want in your photo in front of the Milky Way. You take one photo, the, the Milky Way might show, but the tractor is going to be completely black. Well, with Sequator, you might you, you can take dozens of photos and then combine them to brighten up the tractor. Um, so it's it it seems like it's a it seems like it's a more advanced piece of software, but what it does is it automates some of the, everything that Sequator does could be done with Photoshop, but with Photoshop you might need a hundred steps. Sequator it would be ten steps. Sequator is I believe leave a free download, at least it was when I tried it. <laughs> and then there's so software called Star Trails. Um, the website is startrails.de because it's a, it's a German um, author creating the software, um, but it's available in English. And that's another tool where you can take multiple photos of the sky and then combine them to show what are called star trails, where it's like, instead of being one, photo where the stars are all pinpoint, it shows the motion of the night sky. It's a different style of photography. Um, none, none of my photos here were using star trails, but I do have some samples, some quick samples to John, show. One suggestion. Oh, sure. There's another uh, program called Affinity Photo. And Photoshop is, I don't know, $10 yep. a month right, yep. for a year, $120. I think Infinity, Affinity, with an A is about 80 bucks. And once you buy it, it's yours. Is that only available for Macintosh? Or? No, okay. okay, Ken Spencer just mentioned the software Affinity Photo, A-F-F-I-N-I-T-Y. Yeah, and there's also, um, there's Affinity Photo, there's, Corel has something, is it called Paint Shop, I think? I, I forget what it's called. It's, it's a name similar to Photoshop, but it's a Paint, paint Shop, okay. Yeah, there's there. The, these are this. This is software that I've either um, that that I either use or that I've dabbled in, saw potential in it. Just don't use it on a regular basis. But this this is all software that I personally use, and they're they're all worth looking into just just to see what features it has to decide whether or not it's something that you do or do not want to do. So just to briefly run through how I typically process a photo, and there are a hundred different ways of doing it. Is the first thing I do is I, and I, I take the photo, I get home. When I look at the photo, I see, okay, does the potential, does the photo have potential? If, if I realize, oh, I took this photo, I was taking a photo of the moon and while I was doing it, I didn't realize it, but a truck drove in front of my, my camera and blocked the photo. Um, well, that photo is a discard, or if I grossly misfocused, or I just don't like, oh, I thought this photo had potential, but now, now that I look at it more, um, a half hour later, I took a much better photo. So I, I sort of go through, I, I briefly review all my photos and I sort of call them out to, to leave the ones that I think or worth processing. Then the general order that I do things in, and this isn't necessarily the best order, but it's the way that I do it. I just like the brightness and contrast. I'll often, um, sort of, sort of that I use has what's called the shadow slider, and you adjust that and it brightens only the darker parts of the image. So that's good if there's a photo where you have the moon and the moon's white, or near white, and it's a good color, but I want to make other things in the photo brighter. Adjusting the shadows only brightens the dark parts of the image. Similarly, highlights, if, if maybe the, the other elements of my photo look fine, but the moon is too bright, 
I can adjust the highlights and the brightest parts of the image come a bit lower. Um, I typically use the shadow highlight slider. It can also be done by adjusting what are called contrast curves. Um, or so, so there are a lot of different ways of doing this, even with the same software. But if, um, so I'll I'll go out. I'll start with the with getting the general brightness of the photo the way I like it. Then I'll look at the color. I'll adjust the white balance or sometimes individual color channels. What what that means and and this happens some lenses sometimes in very very high contrast scenes like the moon very very bright and the dark sky background behind it. Some camera lenses suffer from what's called traumatic aberration where not all colors focus evenly. So at the edges of the moon, you might get a green halo or a purple fringe around the out, outer edge. Well, you could turn down, since there aren't many things in a, in a typical photo that are purple, if, I, if I'm using a lens that suffers from purple fringing, I can turn down the purple in my photo, where it, just, where it cuts out that objectionable color. Um, it's also related to like fixed unwanted lens distortion. Um, if some, some lenses might have trouble with high contrast, other lenses might, um, this especially happens with very, very wide angle lenses, things at the edges might get a little warped. And sometimes that adds to the photo, sometimes it takes away. From the photo, like um, it's less of a factor in night photography, landscape photography. If if you take a picture of a tall building and you aim upwards, often the building will look like it's tilted in the photo, where the, just just due to perspective. So there are adjustments. Um, some software can automatically adjust for those sorts. Sorts of things. Straightening the horizon. Sometimes I'm so concentrated on the moon, I have my camera on the tripod, and my camera maybe was tilted. If I'm only taking a photo of the sky, you don't notice it. But if there's the ground and the ground's tilted, if it looks like the 1960s Batman TV show <laughs> villain hideouts, well, that can be corrected with software. You lose the edges as you correct things, so you'll lose some content from the edges, but you can fix things <coughs> like that. It's, it, the general rule is have your camera correctly aligned, but sometimes it just doesn't happen. And at night, it's often difficult to tell that because you just, you can't always tell where the horizon is. Um, then I, my prop for composition, if there was something distracting at the edge, the field, instead of erasing it with Photoshop, what I might do is I might crop the edge of the photo, just to take that completely out of the photo. Um, and then the final step is um, I'll apply sharpening or it's there's a clarity setting in Lightroom. It uses a different technique than sharpening, but it has the, it gives the appearance it uses what's called micro contrast to make the image look sharper. Uh, I try not to go too far with it because if, if you over sharpen a photo, you start getting these artifacts around things where you get these halos where it'll look sharp, but it will also look, you'll get like halos around things, bright and dark outlines around things. That, because sharpening a photo is often, it's, it's an optical illusion. It applies techniques that trick your eye into thinking the photo is sharper. So these, these are some examples of different processing of the same exact photo that I took. Um, this was for the 2017 eclipse. Um, when I was in Nebraska, tornadoes came through um, safely to the north. Um, but there was a lot of thunder and lightning. <coughs> and the sky above was crystal clear because 
the storms took all the dust out of the air. So the photo on the upper left is a little more natural, and I think I prefer that photo. But the one on the right, the, the lower right, does a better job of showing um, detail in the clouds and showing individual stars. So again, the, the upper left is more to my liking, but the lower right is more detailed. The lower right oh. doesn't look unnatural, which is a yeah. nice thing. Yeah. Yeah, the, the low right is sort of as far as I would dare to push that. I guess one, one thing that's starting to happen, you know, and really, this photo was taken over was a 30 second shutter speed. So it doesn't show individual bolts of lightning. It, and they, there were multiple lightning flashes. These all weren't happening at the same time. So, so the photo is showing a, a time period. Our eyes only see a single moment. So to my eyes, yes, I saw the stars. I barely saw the clouds. The clouds were, were mostly black, other than an occasional flash of light here or there. So just the fact that I took the photo um, over a, with a long shutter, that changes. The, our eyes are only instantaneous. A camera can be over a duration. So this is another photo of Devil's Tower, um, same eclipse trip. We did a lot of driving on this, you know, this eclipse. But the upper left is one photo of Devil's Tower at one point during the night. The photo with the right is a star trail taking many photos, many photos over a very, very long period of time. It's not just one photo, it's a few hundred photos taken in succession. Um, this bright light here, people climb Devil's Tower at night because it's too hot during the day. So, 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 so they will climb, they'll, they'll start like crazy early in the morning, also like 2 a.m. So they're up and then they're back down before the hottest part of the day. Um, so that's what that light is. And by combining all these photos, it allowed brightening up. Now, I, I don't think either, I don't especially like either one of these photos, um, in part because the, the ground here, I, this, this wasn't the camera, it was just it was where I happened to be standing. I couldn't really see the ground well. So I didn't know until I had a chance to do some processing on these photos what the ground in front of me look, look like. Oh, I'm missing a yep. <laughs> Mashed potatoes. But it also, they, there's value to scouting out a site before trying to photograph it. This got there late afternoon. Wanted to see Devil's Tower, saw it, but then stayed later. I hiked around at night, but I didn't know what the ground look like very well. Yeah, I had a headlamp so I could see where I was walking, but I didn't have a good feel for the scene. So this just just briefly talking about because um, Steve Bandel had asked me about this photo in particular. And when I took this photo, my settings, I, I knew that the lighthouse was the point was going to be the brightest thing in the photo. So I made sure my camera settings were such that the lighthouse would be is would, would be as bright as possible to allow me to get some light for the moon, but I didn't want the lighthouse to be completely blown out white. Because the, the way cameras work is cameras, every pixel, it's like a little bucket measuring rain. Like I, imagine you're measuring how much rain you get by putting out a whole bunch of test tubes. Well, if a buck, if, if one of those test tubes is out in a heavy enough rain for long enough, eventually it fills to the top and then the rain just fills out. 
So the photos, once a pixel is 100% white, if your shutter is still open, it stays white. So if, as an exaggeration of this, if I took, if, if I used a five minute long exposure for this camp, for, for this scene, I could open my shutter open for five minutes, but so much light would have gotten in where everything would be white. Even the sky over here would have turned white. So um, when we're taking photos, try to avoid blown highlights. You want things to be just short of completely blown out. And, and you can see this on the back of your camera. If you're taking photos, you can probably set your screen to show it's called the histogram. It's, a, it's like a bell, it's, it's usually a bell curve, um, but it can show peaks. And so you don't want that to be all the way to the right side because once things are going beyond the right, it means you're past white, but you don't know how far past. So, and in this photo, there's even, like in this area here from where the lighthouse beam is hitting the glass, yes, some of this is blown out, but it was, it was a set of compromises because if I, if I got the lighthouse looking perfect, the moon would have been much too dark. Yes, software lets you adjust some of this, but if the moon is so dark, if if there's no light, you can't you can't brighten zeros <laughs> in the computer. John, do you have a, uh, a gradient scale five? I mean, is that the one that you just want to check? Is it too light alongside? Yeah. Well, the, the, you know, to even out the yeah. Right. Yeah, the, the way I adjusted this one was I used I, I used primarily the um, bright the the highlight and shadow settings right. to to balance that the, the lighthouse in the moon. The the original unprocessed photo, the lighthouse was brighter and the moon was darker. Because a during a lunar a lunar eclipse, the moon gets pretty dark. Like the, this scene for a full moon would, would have been easier to process because the moon would have been brighter and closer to the lighthouse's brightness. It's like it, just, just using analogies here. Sort of like if, if you're driving at night, and there are oncoming car headlights. You can't see what's past those headlights. You can put sunglasses on, it'll dim the headlights, but it'll also dim what's, what's behind it. So when you're planning your photos, like this, this photo, I, I didn't expect the eclipse moon to be quite as dark as it was that night. And I, I should have known better. I've taken pictures of lunar eclipses before. So I, so I planned all this out and I'm happy with the result, but it's not quite what I had planned. And I think that's, that's it. So any more questions? Oh. Yes. He moved to New Hampshire. He moved, right? Yeah, it's in New Hampshire, I think. Oh, you remember. Okay, so um, that was an absolutely okay. terrific presentation. Thank you. I love this. First, he kills us with his photographs. I mean, they're absolutely astounding. And and then to give us all the technical background and the planning. I mean, that's like three great talks all in one. So, thank you again for first rate talk. I promised the first rate talk, and it was better than that. So thank you. <laughs> Oh,
Oh, Kent, stop the recording. Oh, jeez. Oh, it, it just said I'm host now. What's that? It just said that I'm the host. Oh, really? So oh, cool. So I'll I will stop the recording. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.